Hello once again to our Pleasant Green Church family and to our beloved brothers and sisters who are taking the time to join with us and listen to our Sunday school lesson from our Faith Pathway study manual. Uh, this is our last lesson out of the uh, winter session of study. And this is Lesson 13 for February the 27th, 2022, uh, from Unit 3, Justice and Adversity. And the title for our lesson for this Sunday is Hope for Justice. Hope for Justice. Our devotional reading is Zechariah, the 7th chapter, verses 8 through 14. Our background scripture is Job, the, 47th, uh, the 42nd chapter. And then our printed passage is Job, the 42nd chapter, verses 1 through 6, and then 10 through 17. And our key verse is, You asked, Who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Uh, this was the third verse of the 42nd chapter of Job. And our lesson's aims are understand the necessity of being humble before God. Appreciate how God listens to your thoughts and responds with justice. Help others see the justice of God in difficult situations. And our lesson has three parts. And the first part is a contrite confession. Our second part is restored prosperity. And then our concluding section is replaced prosperity. A contrite confession restored prosperity, and replaced prosperity. Uh, my name is Minister Leonard Harris, and as always, it is a pleasure and a blessed opportunity uh, to indulge into the Word of Scripture uh, that we might be better prepared to serve Almighty God and God's will in our lives. Uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you and honor and recognize and bless your name uh, that you have given us this, another opportunity to indulge into your word uh, that we may study it and digest it and that we may learn from it, and better equip ourselves uh, to be your servants. Uh, we ask that as we go forward, uh, that the things that we say uh, will be pleasing and acceptable unto thee, but that they will bear fruit, and that the fruit will manifest in the service and the behavior and thoughts and attitude uh, that would be acceptable unto thee. And we ask it all in the name of Christ, and for his sake we ask it. Amen. The introduction of our lesson for this Sunday uh, starts off with a focus on the word hope. And it says, as long as we have life, we have hope. And in the introduction, it states, uh, the focus of the believer's hope is God. 
And biblical hope is the confident expectation of what he promises and its strength is his faithfulness. And I know that we are all quite familiar with the 11th chapter of Hebrews, which reminds us that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And it goes on to tell us, for by it, the elders obtained a good testimony by the active practice of their faith they received a good testimony and then it reminds us that faith we understand that the works of the world were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. The things that we see that are tangible or physical or materialistic, they were not made from things which were tangible, physical, or materialistic. They were made from the demand by the command of God so they were made from nothing that was visible. And yet, from nothing that was visible, we have the things which are seen. And again, it reaffirms that faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In our lesson uh, today, uh, Job uh, is going to be requesting from God because of situations and conditions uh, that Job experienced, uh, things that many of us uh, hope and pray uh, that we would not have to experience these same hardships that fell upon Job. But we learn through the lesson that in spite of our sufferings, in spite of certain uh, conditions that are out of our control, in spite of hardships, yet God is still faithful. And so when we look into our first section, a contrite confession, here we hear from the outpouring of Job unto the Lord, and we receive a response from the Lord back to Job. Job re responds in uh, verse 2, out of our first uh, section of study, uh, a contrite confession, meaning that uh, Job had, uh, he was remorse. Uh, he, he was, um, he was taking account of what he had said he he realized his own shortcomings uh, he was humbled by the fact of acknowledging who he had charged uh, he he felt uh, slighted because of his behavior and his attitude towards the Almighty God and so when we listen to how uh, Job approaches this, what he says is, and I'm reading from the NIV, then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. 
meaning that no purpose of his could be defeated or no purpose of his could be opposed or uh, it could lose its effectiveness, uh, the purpose for which it was created or sent out. And he says, you asked, who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. Now Job begins to recognize and verbally state that who am I to question your wisdom? Who am I to bring uh, statements or suggestions about your actions? And he says, surely I spoke of things I didn't even understand, things too wonderful, things too massive, things too great, too in-depth, things uh, far beyond my ability to grasp and understand, too wonderful for me to know. You said, listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. And then Job states, My ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. Now, to give a further understanding of the remorse that Job was feeling and out of the pain of his inner self as he is pouring out uh, his uh, dissatisfaction with his attitude, his behavior, how he was misled by others, uh, we really need to read a suggested scripture in our commentary uh, which would bring and shine some light into the remorseness that, that Job was feeling. And this is going to be out of Job, the 38th chapter. And we will begin at the 38th chapter of Job and just read a few verses into it so that all of us, as Job had to understand, but so that all of us uh, continue to have a pure perspective of who we are questioning at different times when misfortune falls upon us in our lives. Now, what I like about the 38th chapter of Job is the interest, how we go into how Job said that the Lord said, listen now and I will speak and you will answer me. But look at how God introduces himself. The word says, then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, it's, it's, it's sometimes it's just interesting how God manifests God's self unto us. God uses the forces of creation. Sometimes God gets our attention through a storm. Uh, sometimes God shakes the earth. Uh, sometimes God uses God's creation, the sun, the moon, and the stars. And sometimes God gets our attention from the bountifulness of the waters that God has created. And this one here, God uses the wind, but not just a 
spring breeze. This time, the word says, God appears unto Job and he answered him out of a whirlwind. It kind of symbolizes the intensity in which God is speaking to Job. But listen to what scripture says. In the second verse, it says, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Who are you that you discount or discard my counsel without the knowledge of who I am? It says, now prepare yourself like a man. Don't, don't become a child now. Uh, when you were discarding and mistakenly representing what I was doing in your life, you were, you, you were speaking as one with authority then. So don't start acting like a child now. When, when I begin to question you, uh, don't become meek and uh, defenseless now. Uh, stand up as the man you were while you were making your accusations towards me. So it says, now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me. If you have understanding, tell me. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know, right? You know how I developed and how I determined what the foundation would be and how it would support this massive body of creation that I made. Surely you understand all of that, right? I mean, you must because the way that you're speaking to me is as one with a greater authority than I have. So explain that to me. Tell me since you understand. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know that. Who stretched the line upon it? To what were the foundations fastened? What did you secure the earth to, to make sure it would be stable and uh, uh, that it would be determined and that it wouldn't have a choice to move and do under its own mind. But surely uh, you know that, right? You were there when I established the, what the foundations were fastened to. Who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy, or who shut the sea with its doors? Hmm? Who, who established the boundaries of the sea so they wouldn't overwash the land? How, how is it that we don't experience a constant flood? I know you know because you, you already questioned me on it. So who shut in the sea with doors when it burst forth and issued from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and the thick darkness a swaddling band. I just thought it would be appropriate as Job was responding in remorse and shame for his behavior and attitude that all of us uh, had a chance to understand uh, the magnitude and the majesty of who Job was questioning. Now, our second part of our lesson uh, talks about restored prosperity. And there is a key part here that we want to lift. 
In verse 10, I'm reading again from the NIV. But in verse 10, it starts off, we're talking about restored prosperity. But there was a action that took place to validate the restored prosperity. Uh, it reads and it says, after Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord restored his fortunes and gave him twice as much as he had before. He gave him twice the abundance that he already had, but he gave him twice that amount after he prayed for his friends. Now I want us to look at um, the, the form in which Job prayed for his friends. In the 42nd chapter of Job, beginning at verse 7, it reads in this manner. It says, And so it was after the Lord had spoken these word, words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz and Timonite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. Now therefore, take for yourselves seven bulls and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for I will accept him, lest I deal with you according to your folly. Because you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now, that is saying a lot. Just that one scripture the 10th verse, because it says to us, sometimes we uh, wonder uh, what as individuals, as believers and followers, uh, what effect does that have on others and how does God look at our example, at our walk, how does God look at our demonstration uh, what impact does that have upon the Lord? Here, Job's friends are being are being blessed. Uh, Job's friends are being pardoned because of Job's example. Their acts are being forgiven because of how Job spoke and represented God, but not according to what their friends said. It clearly states that they spoke what was not right in the presence of Job and not as Job had spoken. And so here, but, but a key point here is this, is that, they were not forgiven or pardoned or excused because just the fact that Job prayed. They had to bring an offering. They had to bring something of value. And in that time, uh, cattle, um, uh, it was used many times. In fact, when we talk about the restoration of Job's prosperity, 
it lists in the 12th verse about how much Job's cattle and livestock was multiplied because cattle and livestock were viewed as measures of wealth. And so what was used here to remind us was that God would say, remove some of the wealth that I have blessed you with, bring some of that as a sacrifice for your behavior, for your acts. Bring some of what I gave to you to increase your livelihood. Bring some of that as a sacrifice. Take away some of the blessings I've given you and bring those so I will take away from some of the possessions you have. Bring some of those to remind you not that I need them, but to remind you that your acts, your behavior, your attitude, your actions, those things are weighty or, or heavy measures that cost people a certain uh, uh, punishment. And so I want you to bring those things so that you don't just uh, have the assumption that all it requires is a friend in good standing with God. Just have them to pray for me and all is forgiven. No, I want you to take something of value and bring that as a sacrifice to remind you your actions cost something. Your thoughts and your behavior cost something. So no, it's not just uh, somebody pray for me and then I'm excused and I get away. But there is a sacrifice that is required. As we often recognize there are consequences to our actions. Now, the scripture goes on to tell us that after this act was performed, that after Job prayed and his friends uh, followed the recommendations, the requirements to excuse themselves, it says, then all his brothers and sisters and Everyone who had known him before came and they ate with him in his house and they comforted him and they consoled him over all of the trouble the Lord had brought on him. And each one gave him a piece of silver and a gold ring uh, and other resources. It says earrings. And then the Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life with more than the farmer part. Job was already wealthy, and we know how it spoke about uh, the cattle and that the land and the children and the wealth that Job had in the beginning before his misfortunes, but, or before the sufferings. But here it tells us that in the end, in the latter part of his life, he received more wealth, more blessings, more of everything that he had in the earlier part of his life. And in the end of our lesson, it explains to us that his replaced prosperity, that his sons and daughters were multiplied. And it speaks about how his daughters were considered to be the most beautiful in the land around them. That it says nowhere in all the land were there found women as beautiful as Job's daughters. And their father granted them an inheritance along with their brothers. Now, 
as we close here, as we close here, the commentary tells us, and we know uh, from the study of, of the scriptures, that it was common in that time, and, and unfortunately, this is still common in many cultures today. But it was common then that the wealth went to the sons and not to the daughters. But it went to the sons. But here it says that Job uh, went beyond a custom or a tradition. Job went beyond just leaving wealth to his sons. But it says that he also granted the estate not only to his sons but also to his daughters. And so something uh, we can uh, uh, grasp from this, something we can take from this, is, is that in the process of God restoring God's abundance and blessings to us, we can see that when the Spirit of God is present in the process of this, that God exceeds customary and traditional practices that God placed upon Job that I'm not just going to follow tradition and custom, but I'm also going to make certain that since I have been abundantly blessed, since what I have has doubled, I'm going to make sure that my daughters also receive their portion of that abundance of God's blessing because God is not a respecter of person or place. Now we hope that what we have shared um, has been a blessing uh, to our listeners and that uh, something was gained uh, in the discourse of our lesson. Uh, most importantly, as always, our prayer is, is that we would not just be hearers of the word alone, but the Spirit requires that we would be doers as well. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.